Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my September 2022 reading wrap-up. If you're not already aware, I do weekly entertainment wrap-ups of everything I read, watch, and listen to, but today we're just talking about the books. However, with those weekly wrap-ups, I just did my 300th consecutive weekly wrap-up, which I just continue to celebrate because that's amazing. I've never skipped a week. As always, I'm going to start with the nerdy hardcore stats and charts and then get into what I read. Also, I put chapter markers in all of my videos, so if you have to go back to revisit something or if you need to skip over something because you think I'm going to give you spoilers, even though I try not to give you spoilers, you can do that. That's all down below. On the way down to that, make sure that you are subscribed and, you know, hit that like button. Why not? In September, I read 11 books for a total of 3,914 pages. That is the lowest amount of books that I've read in a month since I started wrapping up my books this way. So that feels a little bit weird. The lowest before this was 14 and I was traveling for a couple of months visiting friends so it makes sense. I'm currently traveling and I've had less time to myself and that type of thing. It just still also feels weird. This year in general feels weird because I think it's going to be the first year since I started booktube where I'm going to have read less than 200 books this year. But we'll find out. Maybe in the last three months of the year I will read a lot. You never know. I should also mention that that number takes into account converting audiobook minutes to pages. So 2,378 of those pages were actually about 67 hours of audio. The age breakdown for these books was seven adult books and four YA books. I read 11 novels, which makes this graph look really weird. This month, the biggest chunk of the genre pie was fantasy, followed by historical fiction, nonfiction, and spec fic. If you adjust by page count, not much changes. Most of these books were from the library, but I had a few that I got from various retailers. I read seven audiobooks, three hardcovers, and one paperback. The biggest chunk of my books were in the 300 to 399 page range, and everything was published in the last couple of years. The majority of these books were written by female authors, and the protagonists were mostly female as well. In terms of setting, the vast majority were in the US, followed by Other Worlds and the UK. In terms of diversity of subject matter, a big chunk were queer, had to do with race, or a combination of two intersections, and one had nothing worth mentioning. In terms of star rating, this month I had one 3.5 star read, three 4 star reads, four 4.5 star star reads and three five star reads. Let's start with the lowest rated read and work our way up to the highest, shall we? My 3.5 star read this month was Siren Queen by Nevo. This is a book that I was really excited about. I actually got an arc and then didn't read it ahead of time because um, sometimes I get overwhelmed and it happens. But I do try to read all of the books I get arcs of even if it's after the fact. This one is set in Los Angeles in the golden age of Hollywood, but it's also set in a world that has magic to it. And the magic isn't fully explained, it's just integrated into the background of what's going on. And I found that really neat because it's always interesting when magic is integrated, but it just seems so normal. To the point where as a reader you don't even question it. You're like, yeah, of course there's magic. Why wouldn't there be? This book centers a young girl who from the beginning really enjoys movies, wants to get into that life, ends up being a background character in a bunch of movies because she wanders on set one day. And then from there there's just a whole magical coming of age tale and that's lovely. Where this book let me down is it kind of ends in a very abrupt way where I don't 100% understand what happened and because we're not exactly explaining the magic I feel like something needed to be there so I would understand exactly what happened. I have some pretty educated guesses but also it just felt like it needed something a little bit more at the end. And that's the only reason why it was the worst book I read this month. And I always feel a little bit bad because when I go back and look over this year I'm going to have to say this was the worst book I read this month and that sucks when it's a 3.5 star book. One of my four star reads, the first one being Scout's Honor by Lily Anderson. This one is also really weird because there is magic in this one as well. It's a little bit more explained. They definitely go back and tell you kind of the history of what's going on in this weirdness, but it's just such an interesting premise. Basically, we have these characters that are in something that's kind of like girl guides. I think they're called ladybugs. I think that's what they're called in this. No, it's ladybirds. Ladybugs would be more hilarious. Instead of being the type of people that sell you cookies and do nice community outreach type of things, these people will actually go out on parole and combat these weird space bugs that just pop into existence on our planet when we're feeling certain emotions and if they're left too long they fester. Regular people can't see these creatures but these certain people can see these creatures and that's why they're patrolling against them. Our main character used to be in the Ladybirds however something tragic happened when she was younger and she quit but now her mom is forcing her to train up some other Ladybirds and that comes with a whole host of problems and shenanigans ensue. 
I thought this one was really cool. I really enjoyed seeing how this one progressed. I really enjoyed the different women that we saw coming together. I really enjoyed how this specifically was trans inclusive, which was good. Overall, I just had a fun time with this one. Next, we have The Inheritance of Orchida Divina. This is a long family saga, and it starts out with this woman named Orchidia writing all these letters to all of her descendants saying, I'm about to die, come collect your inheritance. From this, we see them going to her house to find out what's up, but also find out about her backstory and they are finding out about her backstory and all of these magical, incredible things that have happened. There are many people in her family that think magic is just regular because that's the way they were raised with her. And there are other people that think that her magic is ridiculous and why would it be happening? And they just very much in the mindset that it should not be happening and uh, they're ignoring it, which is, wild when you consider they've seen things with their own eyes. This one had beautiful writing and just sweeping descriptions of these different things that happened at different times in her life. And if you like big family saga types of books, you will probably enjoy this one. Speaking of family sagas, the other four star read I had this month was The Many Daughters of A Feng Moi. This is a book that has to do with the first woman from China who ever went to America. There's a bunch known to her up to a certain point. This happened in the 1830s that she was brought over and she was kind of a sideshow act and eventually she met P.T. Barnum and that's always a bad time for anyone really. But then there becomes a point where people don't know what happened to her. So this is an imagining of her descendants and what happened to them in their lives and the generational trauma they went through and it's again so beautifully written. A lot of it obviously takes place in the past as we're seeing these generations of women growing up and seeing what happened to them but some of it also takes place in the future. And this was just such a wonderful reading experience because I actually got this in a box from the Once Upon a Book Club box and I actually did a whole unboxing and vlog of that so I'll be sure to put that down below because it was such an interesting and beautiful experience and I highly recommend it. On to my 4.5 star reads, the first one being Burn Down, Rise Up. This is a book that I read at the very beginning of the month and it has to do with this girl who lives in New York and people have been going missing for quite some time but it's a big city and that's not too out of the ordinary. However, it becomes personal when somebody she knows goes missing and that person is the cousin of the girl that she has a crush on. From there, they kind of find out that there's this creepy pasta of this thing that you should do in your town to kind of see this different underground world, and that's probably what's going on with these people. But in addition to that, she learns about some of the things that have happened in New York that she didn't previously know, such as in the 1970s, there were a lot of landlords who were just setting their buildings on fire if they had mostly black tenants and letting them burn so they could collect the insurance money. This is one of those books that blends magic and history and learning about these things really well together, and I thought it was done very well. Next we have Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin, and this is a book about two people that meet each other when they're fairly young and then reconnect later in life. This is historical fiction because as they reconnect, it's the 1990s, so I believe they met in the 1980s, when her sister was in the hospital because she had a childhood cancer that she actually makes it through, which is wonderful, and that he was in the hospital because he was in a car accident and he had to have many many surgeries to do with his leg and foot that was completely crushed during this accident. They become friends, they bond over video games and then something happens to split them apart and they come back together later when one of them's at Harvard and one of them's at MIT and they decide they're going to make a video game together. This book is about them coming back together and moving apart throughout life but also about creating video games and having these very intense feelings for each other and always being in each other's life but never being a couple if you will but it's also one of those things where people have to ask because they're so both assumably straight and they're partners in business why they've never gotten together and that's such an intriguing question but it's not the most important question or most interesting question about their dynamic this book was a wild ride and there were things that happened that I don't think I can forgive Gabrielle Zevin for doing because I didn't see them coming and then they punched me in the face and it was just so beautifully written but also just so aggravating at times because you just want the best for people. If you're anything like me, you just want the best for characters and sometimes that's not what happens. This month I also read The Queer Principles of Kit Webb and this was just delightful. Again, this one is historical fiction and this one has to do with this guy who used to be a highway robber. Robberer, he used to be a highway robber. 
However, he was injured on his last job, so now he's retired and he's running a coffee shop. Somebody has figured out that he used to do these types of crimes and needs some help with a crime, so they decide they want to hire him, but he's like, no, I don't want to do it, do it yourself, I'll teach you how to do it. And then there's some uh, romantic tension between these two men, and it's just lovely. Firstly, anything set in a coffee shop just has that level of just being kind of lovely and homey, even if it's not a lovely and homey topic. They're talking about robbing people, they're talking about previous crimes that have happened, that type of thing. But somehow that setting always somehow makes things cozy, and I think that a lot of authors have figured this out, which means that coffee shop AUs of fan fiction apparently are very popular in that type of thing. I don't know, I don't read fan fiction. I have read it, but I don't, I haven't read enough that I feel like I am capable of talking on the subject. I love seeing the build on the relationship. I love seeing this from both of their points of view because one of them is just very out about who he is. He has enough privilege that he can just be queer and nobody can really touch him for it because he's the son of a duke, but that is coming into question as to whether or not that is actually accurate, which is why he needs the help of Kit Webb. So here we are. There is at least one other book in this series and I am on hold for that book and I'm very excited to read it because it centers one of the other characters that we met and I want to know what was going on in the background of this story. The final book of my 4.5 star list for this month was Carrie Soto is Back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This is, I believe, the fourth book in this certain universe that she is writing that I like to think of as the Evelyn Hugo universe because that's the first book of this very loose series. It's not actually a series, they're all companion novels, but they sometimes make reference to each other, which is just neat because there's certain characters that live in this world. Carrie is definitely a character we learn a little bit about in Malibu Rising, but we don't really get to know her all that much for obvious reasons if you've read that one. This is set in the 80s and 90s and she is a tennis star. She's actually been retired for about five years when we meet her in this book, and she holds the title for most Grand Slam victories out of anyone in tennis. Not just women's tennis, anyone in tennis. However, in 1994, somebody ties her record, so she decides she needs to come out of retirement so she can get her record back. This means that in the 1995 season, she's going to play the four tournaments that happened that year, and hopefully she wins at least one of those so she can get her title back. I am not a big sports person. I know very little about tennis, but I devoured this. I now feel like I kind of understand a little bit of how tennis is scored. I still don't really understand why they can't just count like you would in any other sport, but that's neither here nor there. This book made me feel like I gave a crap about a sport that I've never given a crap about before, and that's saying something. To be fair, in the past I have really enjoyed sports-related media as long as it gives it a narrative, and that's what this is. I can't just sit down and watch sports but I can sit down and watch a movie about sports or read a book about sports all day long and I absolutely enjoyed this. This is such an interesting character, right? Because she's not a likable person. And I love that we have this character that people are like, I wouldn't probably want to hang out with this person in real life because why would you? But she's still given this interesting, complex story. And again, this is another one of those books where I'm just like, oh, I saw that this thing could happen and then it did happen, but I didn't expect it until it just happened and it broke my heart. So good job, Taylor Jenkins Reid. On to my five star books, the first one being the Heartbreak Bakery. This one is about a baker named Sid who works at this queer bakery and they come to realize that after they've broken up with their girlfriend and baked these brownies at the bakery that everyone who's had a brownie from that batch starts breaking up, which is not a good time because their boss actually ate one of those brownies and they don't want their bosses to break up because if their bosses who own the bakery break up, what's going to happen to the bakery? With the help of a very cute co-worker, they go on this mission to right the wrong of all of these people who have had the brownies, and that comes with a lot of challenges that also comes with a lot of baking montages and a lot of different recipes, and this is just so wholesome. Again, a bakery is like a coffee shop, it's like a cafe, all of these are places that are just so wholesome and lovely and I just very much enjoyed this. The penultimate book on this list is a memoir, and that's I'm Glad My Mom Died. And honestly, after reading this, I have to concur with the title because the author's mother 
was not the best person. And ultimately for the mental health and well-being of this author, it is the best that her mother did end up dying of cancer eventually. I had never really seen the TV shows that Jeanette McCurdy was on. Um, she did mention that she was the female Dewey in one episode of Malcolm in the Middle, so I have technically seen her on television before, but I didn't see the shows that she was big and famous for. So I imagine there are a lot of people that have a connection with her because they're used to seeing her on television, but that wasn't my case. I actually watched a really in-depth review of this book by Savvy over at Savvy Reich's Books, and she talks so heavily about how this was an excellent example of how to write a memoir that I was like, sure, I'll read it. I like memoirs, and if it's well written, I'm going to enjoy it, and it's obviously on my five-star list this month, so Savvy was correct. This book, however, comes with a lot of trigger warnings. We are talking about the death of a parent. We are also talking about a parent who is sexually abusive and manipulative, and was the reason why her daughter had several different eating disorders, and didn't even realize she was being abused until after her mom was gone, so take all of that. There are other things that happen in this well that might be triggering, so make sure that you check out the resources I have down below to check out trigger warnings, because I always feel like I'm going to miss one and I will feel bad, so please research it ahead of time if you have any triggers. Reading this, you can tell that this author needs to be an author, needs to be writing, because she sets scenes perfectly, and it's just so very well written. So if you like memoirs, this is definitely one to check out. Last on this list today is actually an audiobook that Chad and I listened to the entirety of while we were driving from Peace River to Fort Smith, and that is Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. Firstly, this is a NaNoWriMo book, and that is excellent. Secondly, the author narrates the book, and that is excellent because apparently that is his full-time job, so that just makes sense. Even though this is a fairly new book, there's a good chance you've heard of it before because I believe it was published with a fairly small publisher, and then Tor has picked it up as well. And this is another book that takes place in a coffee shop, except for this is a Dungeons & Dragons inspired book. So it takes place in a coffee shop that is run by this orc in a world where people don't really know what coffee is, so they have to get used to the idea of going to a coffee shop. And that all of that was just so lovely. Seeing this character decide that she no longer wants to live this mercenary lifestyle where she has to go out and kill people for money and all of that, and wants to just settle down and have this coffee shop and makes these friends along the way, it was just so wholesome just so lovely. There is a sapphic relationship in it, but it's definitely not the center of this. It's just a lovely little bonus. All of the hype for this book is definitely warranted. I very much enjoyed this, and I'm so glad that I have the memory of listening to the whole thing with Chad while on a road trip. That's just lovely to me. If you want to hear me talk more about these books, or other books for that matter, the playlist for my weekly entertainment wrap-ups is always linked down below. If you've read any of these or want to read any of these, please let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you happen to be on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a coffee account, which is a digital tipping service. And given the fact that I've talked about coffee shops so much in this, I think it's extra cute that that company is called Coffee. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye.